So the typical startup story goes like somebody has an idea, assembles a group of people, they um, start out making an MVP, trying to get investors interested, trying to get first clients, and then the team grows. So what about culture? When is the best time to define culture? And what do we need to define the culture of a company with hyper growth in mind? Rodolf, do you want to start? Thank you. Um, to me, it's in the very early days. Um, you know, culture, again, it's not something that you really define. It's more something that you need to think on what kind of company do you want to build? And it's not just the founder, it's something that you start doing with the team that is with you and start thinking about, okay, why, why were we together? What's the speed of this collective? And that's what you start creating a company culture. Mm -hmm. From stories that I've heard, very often it is, you know, you have an idea and you assemble a group of people that you know from your network, so you're all like-minded. But culture is not always, you know, assembling people that are like-minded, but you, depending on the culture that you want to define, you need different mindsets. What is your experience in defining the culture of Hotel Tonight? Yeah, uh, I think it's important to define the culture early and intentionally and then very um, specific in the definition. So. We, we defined it as three words, build, question, and respect. And the word question is around curiosity, and that's where we got some diversity into mm -hmm. our culture. Diversity of thinking, diversity of different opinions, of people, we encourage people to voice their opinions. And ultimately, that's the company that I wanted to work for. And so we as founders created that company that we wanted to work for. I mean, you both said early on. What, what is early on? Kind of what stage? Can you nail that down? Or it was when we were uh, probably about seven people, um, so a few months in. And once we realized we had product market fit, and we were like, we were still worried about running out of money every week, um, but we thought we'd be able to take off, right? Mm -hmm. All right, so maybe we went from worrying out, about running out of money every week to worrying about running out of money every month, and that's when we did it. Yeah. Okay. I like like Sam. You see, we were roughly eight, ten people in the company a few months in, and getting a first off site with this early team. Not thinking about the business, but more about us, the company we wanted to build, and why we were here together, mm -hmm. and started to shape the foundations of the company culture. Mm -hmm. And was it the whole team that defined the culture, or were you as the founders leading the definition? How the did you go about it? The way we did it, as, so we gathered as founders, asking ourselves why we were here together, and what we wanted to, to achieve together, the ways of working we wanted to have, the kind of type of company we wanted to bring. And then we came to the team saying, hey, us as a founder, this is the kind of value that we want to operate in, but how does that resonate? What's about you? Mm -hmm. And the team started to formalize their observation on how we were working together, on the ambition that we had together, and started to formalize, actually, yeah, as, as a team, the company culture. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you mention a few key points that are included in the culture? Like a few definition points in the culture? Sorry, key points? Yeah. yeah, so your culture, if you would describe it, what would be like the three most important points that define your culture? So it evolved over time, I think. Um, um, but in the early days, it was, it was very intangible. It was all about, OK, how do we want to work together? OK, we want to have a lot of freedom in our ways of working. OK, that's, that's something that we share collectively. We've got a strong ambition of what we want to achieve. We don't know if we're going to reach it, but at least we want to try. And that was one of the elements of the culture. We, the growth mindset was there. We were here together to learn. Uh, this is the kind of environment we wanted to have. And again, that was part initially of the culture. And then the team started to think, how we implement that in our routines, in our rituals. It needs to be totally embedded into the operating system to actually work. Yeah, okay, so the, the first key point was defining the culture at the starting point very early on. The second one is as you grow with the team, and you're t both um, technology-based companies, so I assume you had to grow pretty rapidly and acquire new talent very fast. How did you go about in recruiting people? Um, was it more of a culture fit? Was it the culture ad? Sam. Yeah, it, it varied by team, um, and one of the teams that where we did the best job at this was the market management team. 
um, this is the team that works with our hotel partners, account management. And in the hotel industry, account managers are usually hated by hotels. And so we wanted to change that dynamic. So we specifically said we're not going to hire uh, from Booking.com, from Expedia. Um, we're going to hire people that are really respectful. So going back to one of our cultural values of respect. We want to treat them like you know, we would want to be treated on the other end. And so we, we hired people and trained them um, and then and built this team from scratch. Our, my co-founder actually did a lot of that, or did all of it, and he had this vision of a war room or a press room with people buzzing all the time and talking about getting the best deals for tonight and last minute. Um, and he built that and manifested it, and it was incredibly valuable um, and a big asset to the company. Um, and, it, and that worked much better than other teams where we hired sort of whoever, more opportunistically. So I think it was, uh, if we had been more intentional about who we were hiring in other teams, I think we would have been more successful. So I think you're subscribing to the um, hire for attitude and train for skills? Yeah, uh, that, that definitely out? worked mm -hmm. best for us, yes. Yeah. How would you see that? <laughs> I think we've done, um, I don't know about you, Sam, but this mistake of when you, you bring someone that seems to be very talented and then well, there is kind of a miscultural fit and doesn't work as expected with the team and starts creating a lot of friction, etc. Uh, and so you learn from that and you understand, okay, uh, uh, we need to find a way, because culture is quite intangible, but to find a way if we believe in the same thing in our hiring process, so trying to find this cultural fit, how we can detect that, how we can uh, understand if we've got these shared beliefs. Uh, so at first I was uh, hiring, in the, I was part on the hiring process of the 300 first people in the company, but this is clearly not scalable. Uh, so we had to learn on how we, how we create this kind of cultural fit interview that remove kind of bias also and make it as a scalable process to bring people. Again, it's not about bad or good, but just that would fit into the spirit of your own organization. Okay, maybe you can give us some examples. I, I also support companies in talent management and recruiting, and um, it is always a challenge to convey the culture that a company has in the written form, because you do advertisements to um, attract new talent. How do you do that? I mean, today it's not enough to say, you know, you get free coffee, we have a ping pong table, we do, I don't know, eat outs every Friday. How did you go about in acquiring the new talent to bridge that gap? when you had like recruitment ads out. You have some examples for us, Sam? So in the recruiting process or in the, yeah, um, I think it, it had to do with the way that we would ask questions and, and the types. So we wanted to get at, do they embody these three areas? And they became our pillars. Like, are they, are they a builder? So are they action oriented? Um, do they have a bias for action? And do they have, demonstra have they demonstrated that? You know, do they question, right? So do they um, come up, are they curious about the business that we have? I, re I uh, remember uh, uh, recruit uh, recruiting somebody, interviewing them, and uh, I said, do you have any questions for me? And they said, no. And I said, great, the interview's over then, right? Um, in a very respectful way, I said that. Um, and then uh, on respect, it's, you know, it basically is the no a-hole rule of, looking for, were there, uh, was there drama, was there friction in previous employment situations, or is that coming through in the interview? So we followed those three pillars, and that was our North Star, and it worked very well for us at, at finding the right talent that fit for us. Okay. It's on both sides also, you know, the candidates try to understand the company culture from the people they meet during the interview process. So on your end, you try to understand if you, you know, if we share these attributes, uh, but also on their hand, they want to understand in which company they want to work for. And here, I honestly believe that you know, the best ambassadors of your culture are just your employees, so people working for the company, and they're just sharing all things in, are in your organizations, sharing about the culture, but not, you know, not formally as the culture code, more on the experience, the day-to-day -day experience they are, they are living. And uh, I think that creates you know, these two side uh, alliance between people saying, oh, okay, this is, this is where I want to work for. And on our hand, okay, I believe that this person will fit in our ways of working. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so we, uh, the second point we spoke about was recruiting. That takes me to the third key element of company culture is what kind of processes um, do we need or programs internally to ensure that the culture is kept? Can you give us some examples, Rudolf, what you uh, did in your company? Yeah, I think it's, it's all about there are a lot of small things that need to be part of the rituals of the company and that emphasize your company culture. So for example, if we are all about this growth mindset, you know, there is this ritual that we've got every week for every team that is making a retrospective of the week, saying, okay, what we did well, what we didn't do well, what we've been learning uh, uh, during this week. And this kind of rituals helps actually saying that the culture is really embedded. It's not just, you know, posters that you've got on the wall uh, and that's, uh, 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 that's are pretty empty. Uh, it needs also to be embedded into all your people processes. That's where it's important. In the end, you know, culture that make you why you hire people, why you promote people, why you fire people. Uh, it's, it's really, it needs really to be embedded into that. And particularly, and Sam, I'm sure you've got more experience than me on that, when the company starts to grow, and that culture from the early employees starts to be shared with more and more and more and more people. Right. I mean, it was not just the pandemic, but uh, working remotely was also true for some people um, the years before. How do you go about with making sure these processes work with teams that are working on site, that are working off site remotely, different countries? One of the things that we did and, and one of the manifestations of respect is a transparent culture and transparency from the top down. And one of the, the tools we used for that was a weekly all hands. Uh, we called it HT Nation, Hotel Tonight Nation. And it was a half hour, started on time, ended on time, um, and very programmed view of what's going on in the business. So I would lead it off, or some, someone from finance would lead it off with the metrics for that week. Um, and then also, what are the key initiatives and how are they going? And it was very uh, candid. Like, it wasn't all wine and roses. Um, and so we'd bring up challenges and say, hey, these are opportunities for us. Um, I, uh, when I talk to people about their best memories of Hotel Tonight, surprisingly, they, I mean, when I was talking to the group, you know, during those, it's, you know, a lot of uncertainty on how they're responding to the, the time. They say that that's one of their favorite memories, was that time to get together. And we did it at a time uh, early in the morning on Pacific time so that teams from Europe could also be part of it. That everybody gets on the same page, we all get together, we know what we're talking about, we know what we're doing, and then we can get back uh, to execution. Right. And can you share more info on, let's say, typical tools? I don't know, Slack, Teams wasn't there then. Because when you connect um, a team in, from remote areas, it's mostly through email and messaging. Now it's video conferencing. But just typing does sometimes not convey the message correctly, or it can be interpreted differently, which can also cause a rupture in culture. Um, what kind of tools did you work with to get around that problem? We had Slack and we did you know, the video conferencing for the all hands and other meetings. Um, what we also found was important was that uh, one of the founders would regularly, so we had offices in New York, uh, headquarters in San Francisco, offices in New York, London, Berlin, and Paris. Important for one of the founders to visit those offices every few months. Um, and then the other was we did like an office exchange program that mm -hmm. was somewhat of uh, merit-based, somewhat of a lottery um, and, and randomized where somebody from one office could go visit somebody from the other office. Mm -hmm. We're in the travel business, so everybody was raising their hand wanting to travel. We couldn't fly everybody all the time. Um, and that, though, cre uh, created a lot of understanding. They were kind of, when they came from Berlin to San Francisco, they were a guest. So we showed them around. We uh, indoctrinated them into what made our culture special, and then vice versa. And uh, I think that, that was uh, very successful as well. That almost sounds like a promotion to me <laughs> to get selected for a program like that, which is um, one of the, the fourth key elements. So if you're hyperscaling, you know, you're adding talent very fast, you're also adding responsibility, and you want to you know, raise people within the company. How were your promotion cycles, or what, uh, how did you go about to develop people internally to give them more responsibility and you know, broaden their field of work? Uh, that, that's one of the great things of hypergrowth. You know, it brings a lot of opportunity for people in the company, right? Most of the job that the company will have tomorrow are not existing today. So the question here is how, as an organization, we can support people 
to navigate this ambiguity, but also to get the skills so they can grow with the organization. Very tactically, you know, we've got promotion cycles twice a year, which is more about, okay, are you really performing in your job or, and having these career discussions on what's, what's the kind of area are you most interested in mm -hmm. so we can bring you the learning and development programs that helps support your growth. Mm -hmm. um, um, and then we put a lot of resources uh, as much as we, you know, that were, I think there was a moment in time which is pretty recent where initially we didn't have this level of support both from, for example, learning practices uh, um, to, to structure our learning and development and now where we are an organization of roughly 500 people that can actually build a strategy to develop uh, people uh, mm -hmm. on where they want to grow with the organization. And what would be the average cycle when people got promoted? You know, when I started in business, it used to be like, ah, oh, at least two years. You got to stay in one position, two years, three years, and then maybe you get promoted. Um, I would assume it was faster. Did you have a rule, or was it just based on the people's skills? I think it, it's hard to answer this question. Obviously, as the, in the early days, most people were very young in the company. Huh? Uh, so basically, you know, a lot of them were just the first job, their, their first job in life. And they've been challenged every day to organization. So people that came as a, an intern, for example, one year after, they were managing a team of 30, 40 people. Yeah. Which, you know, you develop some kind of muscles doing that, but other muscles that you didn't develop through experience, et cetera, et cetera are still weak. So how do you bring this, again, level of coaching, development, and we brought external support to help our people develop on this muscle that they don't, didn't have so they can succeed with their job. Early days, promotion are very quick, but then you start moving into a moment when you need to bring experts in your organization that will help other people also grow. Uh, uh, and obviously, when you are more into senior roles, the path of promotion is less, is less uh, uh, yeah. Quick. So I mean, growth also means change. Um, in your case, Sam, <laughs> change was um, being acquired by uh, Airbnb. So for me, the question now is, how do you go about reassessing, realigning cultures? You're bringing together two worlds which fit together, otherwise you wouldn't have made the deal. But still, how often do you think do you need to reassess a culture in a company? Um, and how do you do it? Who do, whom do you involve? I mean, there are a lot of reasons for doing the Airbnb deal. Uh, it was opportunity for the team. Uh, it was bo we're both based in San Francisco. I have a friendship with Brian. And the cultures are very similar. Um, they're both very respectful. So our, one of our values is respect. Airbnb's values create a world where everybody can belong. So that worked really well together. Um, that said, I, one of the things that we've done and that I've heard that we've done is bring this idea of building and a bias for action and a and about being very specific and disciplined with decision making. Um, and brought some of that to Airbnb. And likewise, Airbnb's brought a fair amount of this idea of really intense design um, uh, approaches and processes um, to developing products and developing systems. And so the combination of the cultures, I mean, we're much smaller than Airbnb in terms of people and, and on every measure, um, though I think that both cultures sort of got better um, and the resulting combination is, is a superior culture and a superior company. And it resonated with the people? How, how hard was it to you know, convince the people that you have a culture ad now because of the merger? Uh, how hard is it to convince the culture, the, the, the people? The people of the new added culture piece. Yeah, it, I think it, it took a little bit of proving that this could work. It took some examples. It took, um, took a little time you know, for us to, to have a few wins. So, but we'd like to move quickly, so it didn't take more than a few months. Okay. Last words from you, Rodolf. How do you reassess the culture in your company? What's important for you, and how often do you do it? I think it's something that comes from the team. Uh, regularly, I would say every 18 months, we need to ask the collective, OK, and again, th there is the culture that is intangible, and there is the formalization of the culture, which is good. But thinking about, OK, do we believe in our values? Is this something that we operate today? Is this something that is still adequate with the stage of the company? Uh, this will come from the organization, 
don't know if I've got still a mic, yeah, from the organization that redefine, evolve this culture code uh, so they can continue, the, the belief continue to be there uh, in their company. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. It was a pleasure having this conversation with you. Thank you for joining thank us. Thank you.